on. Oh. Thank you, Yase, recording in progress. So welcome to, um, to my slide deck. And what you will notice is that I, I usually don't use the slideshow button. So a lot of people, they like to do this and you'll see the whole screen. But for my purposes, I'm going to on purpose not show the whole screen because I'd like you to be able to scroll down and see what's coming. So that's another piece. When you are online, it's not just about the presenter control, especially in the modern thinking now, we want to give learner autonomy and learner empowerment and agency. So by allowing people to have the slide deck at your fingertips, you can do whatever you wish. You can scroll, you can actually go through the slides and just listen to my audio. This is a different way of doing instruction compared to when we were in school way back when. And so that's the first step that I'd like to bring you into this mind frame that visual literacy is not just about pretty pictures. It's about giving agency to the learner in more than one way, because in traditional delivery, it's only using language literacy, whereas visual literacy brings in a whole different thing. Uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce you to gestalt psychology um, in this session as well. But welcome. This is my front page. The title of today is what you see is not what you get. Uh, and if any of you are familiar with the word hidden curricula, I use that uh, theory a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and um, type the word hidden curricula. If you're not familiar with it, I believe that's um, that was uh, by, is it Flavel? I may be wrong, but I'm going to type that name inside there. I may be wrong. Somebody can correct me on that. So there's also a QR code, which we're all familiar with. But I invite you to take a look at this page, just this front page. Look at the colors and look at the fact that, you know, I swapped the letter O with a QR code. All of this is part of that visual literacy and just thought psychology that I'll be covering today. As an overview, we are going to be having two sessions throughout MyFest on this topic. If you miss the second one, that's okay. And people who want to come in from this in the second one and miss the first one, that's okay too. But there might be people who are really interested in this topic. So I promise you, I will do some slightly different things in session number two. And I will be doing maybe a little bit higher end uh, uh, hands-on stuff in session two. So if you enjoy today's session, I invite you to come in on the second session, same time, but on a different day. Uh, today's Friday, the other one I did exactly one month from now, and that would be on a Monday, okay? So that's the overview. There'll be a slight difference. You can see over there, the, the session two will be activity first, whereas today I'll be doing a little bit more talking first because it's the first time you're seeing this material content and I'd like to give you some theoretical background. We will be doing some hands-on today and the tools today uh, will be doing work in this uh, Google slide. So I see most of you do have access into this Google slide deck. I see, yep, I think everybody's here. Everyone is um, in, in slide number two, so that's okay. Um, so the word iconography is one of the concepts I'd like to introduce to you first. We all know what an icon is. An icon is a symbol. It's usually pictorial. Uh, for people who rely on the audio uh, uh, or text-based translation or transcription because they need that for the screen reader, then there will be this automated device on the computer itself that translates what's visual into an audio signal uh, or a text written uh, uh, overlay or pop-up. Uh, but iconography is pretty much um, a way that the human brain is being tapped or we borrow memories from the human brain, uh, memories that we already have. And so by showing a picture or an icon, they call it an icon, an image that taps into a previous memory, we can make people immediately 
um, make connections. And so that's what iconography means. It's the science of making connections to memories that we already have. And so this is one of the core things that I'd like to uh, highlight in today's session is that we will be using the philosophy of iconography a lot tapping into memories that we already have, like a smiley face. We know that a smiley face means, oh, this is not so serious. It's going to be something a little bit more fun. Um, and maybe the glasses. So maybe it's something a little bit more uh, academic or something that requires reading. Uh, so I purposely put in some icons into the word iconography here. The other piece of theory that I will be using a lot in today's session is called gestalt psychology. Um, as educators, many of you may have heard this word gestalt psychology before, and if you haven't heard the word gestalt, maybe you've at least heard of this uh, phrase, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. If you're interested in the theory of gestalt psychology, um, whenever you see the rabbit icon on the bottom right hand side of the slide, it actually has an embedded URL, so those are rabbit holes. So the icon of a rabbit for rabbit holes, which is, if you know rabbit hole from the story of Alice in Wonderland, the rabbit goes down the hole and can go into another faraway land and more and more information comes from there. So that's the rabbit hole there. You're welcome to take a look at that on your own time um, on the background of gestalt psychology. But for those of you who are not familiar with gestalt, and maybe even for those of us who, who have heard of it, but this would be a good revision. There are seven gestalt principles. Um, and, and I'll just very, very quickly go through the seven. Uh, you don't have to memorize this at all. The first one is called closure. So closure is this first little graphic here. Um, and it's actually sort of a curved line, a little squiggle V, and a sideways V. But when you put them together, your brain connects it to look like the letter G. So even though there is no connection, there's no closure between the different parts of this image, it becomes the letter G. Now, I, I invite you to think about this. If we are dealing with students or audiences who are relying on um, the automated tools that convert visual cues into text overlay or into uh, audio uh, audio transcriptions of, of um, visuals, maybe if they are hearing impaired or, or if they are uh, visually impaired, some of these gestalt principles will be almost impossible to recreate unless the AI that is used uh, for those transcription tools uh, is taught how to do it. So, so I, I invite you to just think about that. There's no solution at the moment. I'm just inviting you to think about that because if we as educators and as deliverers of information and, and facilitators of learning, if we ourselves don't understand the gestalt psychology intended uh, in the original design, can you imagine how lacking our materials would be for uh, students and audiences who are relying on the AI uh, platforms that are going to then translate what we put up. And if we're not conscious of what we put up, it becomes sort of a lost opportunity at best, and it can become a disaster at worst, that we don't even realize these things are not uh, being uh, uh, translated uh, in the right way. The second one is called proximity. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 little circles. So the transcription um, um, automated artificial intelligence tool might say there are 14 circles with the label proximity. But for those of us who are not visually impaired, we take a look at it, the human brain according to gestalt psychology, automatically reads the letter E because of the way these 14 balls or circles are placed together. And we cannot help our brain. We cannot help but see the letter E. And even if you try not to see it, we cannot not see it if we are visually uh, able people. Um, and so that, that's the law of proximity is that 
our brains work that way. And I, I don't want to go through every single one in that much detail, but the next one is continuity. What it is, is the letter S and there is a gray, uh, three pieces of gray uh, shapes that superimpose on the S, but it looks as if it is a bar or a stick that is weaving through the letter S, but our brain sees it as a continuation of that gray member. Um, the fourth one is called enclosure. Again, there are five times so 25 circles uh, and there's a gray area. But what our eyes and our brain sees is it sees the letter T. Even though there isn't really a letter T, that's what our brain sees. Uh, now for the next one, the fifth one called figure ground, um, it's a shape. But how many of us see the black shape which looks like an inverted V. And how many of us see the white shape inside of it, which looks like a Christmas tree or an arrow pointing upwards? So this is an ambiguous thing. When you come to ambiguity or things that could be either this or that, that's where you can actually start hiding uh, messages, subliminal messages in what you create. The, the sixth one is called similarity. There are four times 520 objects on the screen, but our brain says that there's two types of things. There's squares and there's circles. A brain will automatically connect together the clumps of things together. And the last one is connection. Uh, you can see a whole bunch of little dots and they're connected by line. So this is just out psychology. Again, there's another uh, uh, rabbit hole. You can go and uh, click on that and you can, uh, look at that a lot more clearly. I'd like to invite you to look at a different kind of gestalt, and this is the art of animation. There's two objects on the screen. One is a green rectangle, the other one is an orange rectangle, and they just kind of randomly placed on the screen. What happens when you put them side by side and connect it? What does your brain start to do? It starts to make a connection oh, there's two objects and they're connected as compared to when they were just randomly placed on the screen. Now you place them together, it starts to have a relationship. What if they're one on top of each other instead of side by side? What is the relationship when one is above the other? Your brain starts to create meaning where there isn't any given to you. I said nothing about what the green or the orange mean, but your brain will start making a difference between the first one, which is two objects of two different colors randomly placed on the screen. The next slide shows the two objects now are placed side by side. And the third slide shows that these two objects are placed one on top of the other. But what if I separate them? Do you still see a relationship between them now that they're separated? And how close do they have to be to each other to recreate that relationship again. Our brain does funny things to ourselves. Even though these two objects are not touching each other because they are placed in alignment to each other, our brain wants to make a relationship between them. And then what if we place a box around it? Then our brain starts playing even more games with us. It starts saying, oh, these two things are supposed to be together. What does it start to look like? Our brain will start creating meaning. But what if the outline is separated? This next picture doesn't show a single outline over both shapes, but it shows each shape having its own outline that has a different impact as well. But let's go back to one outline for both objects. And this time the outline really is tight, it starts to give another meaning to it. It's like, oh, there's one object divided into three parts. Our brain will create that kind of interpretation. But what if this object is moved? What if you make this object fall down? I use the word fall down. Nothing fell. This is a static diagram on a screen. But because there's an arrow, and because there's a dotted line showing where the previous object was, and suddenly the same object or similar object is now no longer vertical, but it's horizontal, and there's an arrow, our brain created movement where there was absolutely no movement. The only thing that happened was I clicked from slide 15 to slide 16, but our brain made movement there. And then if you do the same thing, 
and now the arrow is not orange, the arrow is green and it's turning it the other way around, then your brain starts going, oh, so it did a flip around. First it fell down and then it went up again, but it went up again the other way around. And our brain can accept that as a movement simply because you see these graphics and also because you hear my audio. But even if I didn't speak, I'm gonna rewind again. I'm gonna show you slide number 14. The object is standing upright. Slide number 15, there's an arrow showing that the object may do something. Slide number 16, that same object now is in a horizontal position, no longer vertical, and there's a dotted line where it was before. And then the next one is there's a dotted line where it implies it's going to with a green arrow showing a movement a different way. And then the last image shows, yep, that's right. It actually did stand up. And now if I were to repeat that same thing and do it in a slideshow format, and I just go bam, 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 your brain sees it as an animation. And that's actually how animation first began during Disney back in the olden days. All right, so that's, that's another very powerful uh, visual literacy device besides the gestalt psychology, which is motion. You can create motion and movement when there is none at all by just adding certain things, all right? So now we've got two things side by side. What if I drew a line in between these two things? Your brain starts making a kind of relationship and you go, wow, the thing on the left has a larger green and a smaller orange. The thing on the right has a larger orange and a smaller green. There's a line between them and both of them have this white band in the middle it actually starts to look just like today's um, lesson plan that I showed you right at the beginning. Do you remember this one? Yes. So that's actually the design of, and I'll scroll right back up slide number two. That's where that came from. So now that I've shown you that animation, that there's this flipping of this object, your brain is doing something else now. And you see the word session one, you see the word session two, Right, And you know that this has a line in between and it's connected together. And there's a lot of other words on this diagram as well. And your brain starts reading the words and wanting to find meaning into it. So this is what I mean by visual literacy and gestalt design. When you give information to your audience, to your students or whoever it is that you're giving information to, you can build into it hidden meanings. So what you see may just be a bunch of squares and arrows and color and font and text. But now that you know there's more meaning to it, I invite you to take a look at this slide. And I'm gonna keep quiet for a moment and just take a look and notice different things. What things are green? What things are orange? What things are in grayed out dotted lines? What things are in black text? what things are in a different font, what icons are put on the diagram here, this slide, what does your brain want to think about when they see these little icons, these pictures? And I'm gonna keep quiet for a second. I invite you guys, it's a very small group, so you're welcome to just unmute and speak up. Um, or if you want to type it out first, that's, that's great too. So I'm gonna keep quiet for a while. What I'd like to see and what I'd like to hear maybe is some hypothesis or some ideas about what actually do you see on this slide number two, this diagram, now that I've given you some insight to maybe some of the concepts that were put into the slide. So I'll keep quiet for a second. And I'll let you guys unmute. Well, the one thing that strikes me first and foremost is the fact that um, where, where our eyes go is the dark, it's the black. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes the, the, the colors, but only if they're outlined. Um, so like the visual literacy and gestalt design is sort of like a, not so important, but the boxes yep. you have in the middle 
which are outlined. That's what, that's what draws your eyes first. Fantastic, Virginia. And let me give you some insight why that is. That's absolutely correct. Because there's so many words. When you are giving a title of a session to somebody or you're giving a title of a report or, or even if it's an email, there's so much text that you're throwing at people. It becomes overwhelming. So you must do something to this copious amounts of massive text. And you need to do something to that text so that you repress some of it. You make it not so important and you pop up other things so that when an audience is looking at what you're giving them, they know where to go to first. And when they're interested, they go looking for other things. So, so that's the, the why behind it. Now let's examine what you described, Virginia. You said your eyes immediately go to the black. Now why? Because this slide is primarily white background. And the highest contrast is black. Black to white is the highest contrast. The light green and the light orange are much lower contrasts. And the yellow is also much lower contrast. It's closer to white than it is to black. So your eyes will go to the highest contrast. So that's the first rule. If you want to make something pop up to your audience, you play with the contrast and you can do that with colors. Now, again, you do need to realize when you're dealing with an audience of mixed abilities and some of them are relying on the auto transcription by an AI that's going to convert something visual into something audio or something text-based, everything gets lost. So what does that mean? Then you cannot have a single slide with copious amounts of text. You need to then split up this one slide into probably five or six slides so that one slide only has one item. All right. It doesn't mean that you have to do this visual literacy thing. It means you have to understand it so that you know how the humans react to it and you know how the AI re reacts to it as well. Because nowadays we are relying on AI all the time for different things. Okay. So that's 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 um, in response to your analysis, Virginia. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Can I just say one other thing? Sure. This was my first and I have the notes right here. Um, you're talking about doing it for AI, but I have also found that my students who have ADHD and ADD, this is way too much information for them. And those who have um, processing, audio processing difficulties. This is way too much for them also. They need more time. Um, I mean, if they were given this and then you just had that throughout the entire presentation, it gives them a little more time to focus on things. But in terms of, just in terms of slides, that would be really too much for them which is why I had this series. This is why I brought you through the series where I actually split them up. I didn't add the words into it. I just wanted you to see how I took, let's count how many slides. Seven, eight, slide seven, slide eight, slide nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, that's 10. 17, 11, 18, 12, 13, 14, 15 slides. I took this diagram and I split it up into 15 slides. So if you are having an audience where you've got ADHD or you have visually impaired and they're relying on the AI transcription, you need to take your one slide that you designed for a normal visual person and split it up maybe 15 ways so that you chunk the information. So this is what I mean by you don't need to know how to do beautiful, pretty pictures. You need to understand the literacy concepts behind these pretty ways of designing so that you can cater your, your content delivery uh, in an effective way to your audience. Okay, um, 
And then, you know, if you only have the 15 slides, then your, your visual people, the people who can see, they're going to get really irritated. They're like, why are you making us go through 15 slides? Just give it to me on one slide. And so that's why you have to have multiple methods of doing it. Um, and so that's why I'm showing you the original design, which is, you know, just the, the one slide on slide number two. And then sort of a glimpse if I had to break it up and explain to people if I did want to do that, I would break it up into 15 different ways uh, so that I can chunk all the little pieces inside there. But thank you for pointing that out, Virginia. That's, that's good. And in reverse, I have had in my um, years of experience teaching the unfortunate or fortunate uh, uh, instance where people didn't know they were ADHD. People didn't know that they had an impairment until I started teaching about stuff like this. And then it's like, you know, three quarters of the class get it. And a handful of people just don't get it. And I'm like, okay, pause. And I, I told the, 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 the visual people, I'm like, hold your judgment. Let's listen to what the others are saying. And then I said, this is a red flag here. And true enough, I remember there was even once we discovered somebody who never knew his whole life he was colorblind. He never knew it until he attended my class. His entire um, high school life, and he was an undergraduate, he never knew that he was colorblind. And because I used to teach visual literacy in college to undergrads, and, and it was only after my class that you know, he discovered he was colorblind. It was a very emotional thing, of course, but but yeah, thank you for bringing that point up. Anybody else like to say something about what they think? Just this initial. Yeah. Um, okay. So I have a visual thing. I, I even got an operation with my eyes. And when the contrast of the colors and the text is not very clear, I lose interest. I, I think also the losing interest is about the the HDD and then those ones. Mm -hmm. I, I've never known which one it is. But, um, and then when something is a lot, when something is too much in, in a slide, I shut down completely. And um, I actually- Can I ask you, Irene, this, do you, did you get shut down when you saw this? It, it was too much for me. It was too much for me. I waited for you to explain. Um, but it was still too much for me. And, and I, I, yeah, so, so I think it's not only the people with, with I, I don't know what I have, but, but I do that a lot. So it, it, I think we need to consider everybody. And I'm so glad that you're having this conversation. And uh, with, with my I thing, I learned how to have less things on a slide. And I mm -hmm. always have, uh, neutral colors at the background, especially white, or if I'm fancy, I use something else. And then I always make sure that my text is in black and in The bold. worst so thing that, that people used to do when they first had PowerPoint was they started putting fancy backgrounds, like a photograph, and then they put text on it. And that is like the worst thing you can do because it makes it so difficult to see. But I'm going to ask you something. Slide four. There are a lot of words on this slide. Did you feel overwhelmed with this slide, Irene? I only actually, uh, <laughs> I, I, I saw the, the uh, iconography and the rabbit. The rest I didn't bother and the smiley Absolutely. face. Absolutely, but rest, that is the I objective. <laughs> so let me, let, me give you, let me give you a little insight as well. Just because you have a lot of data that you need to give to people doesn't mean that you need to give you did, doesn't mean you need to have people pay attention to everything. If you said that all you saw on this page was the word iconography and the rabbit hole, then I am 100% successful in my objective. <laughs> okay. So a lot of times when we use slides, especially if you're going to use it for an informational giving session, like a lecture or some kind of delivery of content, you don't want to waste precious time during a short one hour delivery to go to details because the human brain cannot handle so much details in a short time. What you wanna do is you wanna say, here's the resources 
there's going to be like 30 slides, but I'm only going to go through the key points, but I'm going to give you the slides so that you can take your sweet time on your own time at your own leisure to, to review it if you wish. And so the way to make people not feel overwhelmed with the copious, the big amounts of data is to make some of that data not important. So everything from the word noun all the way to iconography, plural iconography, definition, blah, 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 traditional picture, da, 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 all the way to or a body of art. That entire long paragraph was on purpose at the bare minimum font size, at the bare minimum using a non-interesting font on purpose so that you don't bother looking at it. So purposely making something boring is a skill. You want to make certain things boring and not important. And okay. you want to only highlight the main thing that you want to give because you only have two seconds. Uh, that's another uh, thing. I, I, I didn't put that slide in here, but I'll probably put it in into the second session. There's another theory about how our different uh, perceptions work. Audio has a much shorter time frame. Uh, of memory, but audio requires longer time to imprint in our brain. Visual has the fastest impact. It's 1 24th of a second. That's really tiny. You show something to someone at 1 24th second of a second, uh, you can get an impact. So that's the other piece. If you really want to get scientific about visual literacy, then you go into the scientific side of you, you measure how many things you're going to put on one page and you literally calculate how many milliseconds you're going to allow the person to look at it. And you can decide, you can control where your audience attention is going to be. So if you're working, for example, in the corporate world and I do some work in the corporate world, I go to that level of detail. When, when, when I'm coaching like CEOs, how to do their presentations, uh, I will tell them, it's like, nope, you only show this piece at the most half a second or this, this slide, you have to show it three seconds because you've got 24 words on there. And so therefore we calculate how many milliseconds of time do you need for your audience to be able to, to, to receive that data. So it's a very scientific thing. Uh, of course, the AIs will do it differently. Uh, but but for us, we're not going to go to that level of detail, but thank you for pointing that out, that, that slide number two was a lot of information, but just for your info, the objective of slide number two in a live presentation was just to say, the title of today is what you see is not what you get. The second line, visual literacy, just felt designed with Rose who said, not important because you're talking to me, you don't need to read my name. So I made that into a color that's not important. And the only thing that you need to see is, there's two boxes and a lot of clouds. That's it, right? That means we're gonna connect in the cloud somehow and there's two sessions being given to you. All the rest is detail. You're welcome to look at it later on. So yes, it's designed to be information so that you know that information is available to you, but you're not necessarily required to remember it. Thank you for sharing, Irene. Um, uh, you. Maria, would you have anything to say? So um, I, I appreciate that that insight. Um, however, I'm just gonna bring into uh, bring in another point which some people uh, adopt, which is that people say, okay, we're not gonna give you our slides because we think that you as students, if you have our slides, you'll not concentrate on our. Uh, on on the explanation and therefore you will miss classes and and, and these whole so, uh, arguments. So, so yes, sir. I'm we... not going to. Yeah, I I I I am going to tread very carefully because I do not want to insult anybody from your university. Uh, but I will say this: that type of argument is old. Uh, no, it's just. And... I... I just don't mean people specifically at my university. I mean, like some people say the, the, these these discussions, and I just wanted to ensure that everyone, like when, when it comes to the visual literacy point, would would be how can we compromise this, or how can we make it True. 
on a medium or on a, on a moderate level. So every, everyone is satisfied. Everyone is, feels, uh, feels okay with their work, you know. So I will tell you something that I used to tell my, my students uh, when I was teaching uh, undergraduate and graduate students, and they would come to me and say, you know, I wish my other professors were like you because I give all my slides out for free and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't limit my slides at all. Uh, and I used to get in trouble with my colleagues because I would advocate for, for slides to be free and open. But I do understand that there's some content that's proprietary. The only thing that I would advise if you are faced with people who are unwilling to allow you to have a, a copy of your slide of their slides, if you have the right um, intent and you know that you're not gonna take their content and you know you're not gonna use it for some profit somewhere else, you have the power to use the technology available to you. There's things called screen capture. Um, you know, and, and especially if it's an online class, I, I would, I used to encourage my students, I'd say, you're from the new generation, you're from the 21st century, use all the tools that you have available to you to protect yourself and your needs. But at the same time, make sure that you are doing it with a heart, make sure you're doing it with the proper, um, um, you know, intent, don't go out and, and start sharing that, uh, screenshot or whatever with, with other people uh, without permission. So that, that would be my advice to you. Protect yourself. You have the right as an individual to protect yourself. And as a student, making sure that you have access to the knowledge that is available to you is a legal right for you to do to protect yourself and your needs. Just make sure you don't abuse it. That would be my advice. I see there's uh, Danielle uh, also online. Uh, welcome. Uh, if, if you have anything to say, Danielle or, or Mariam, uh, you, you don't have to, if you don't want to speak right now, there'll be more uh, opportunity for that. But what I'd like to do right now is I do have a little bit of an activity. What I'd like to, before I head on to the next uh, round of content, uh, there are slides number 25, 26, these are blank. If you don't mind, I'm gonna have a little bit of a silent, maybe three, four minutes, grab a slide, anyone from slides 25. Uh, I can actually make more blank slides. Uh, just pick any slide from 25 to 33, put your name on it and share with me, uh, share with all of us uh, by typing on there, take a screenshot. Take a screenshot of any of the slides that you saw earlier and scribble on it, make comments about it. Uh, or if you feel that something, how would you simplify it? I give you that challenge. If anybody would like to take slide number two, copy slide number two, delete stuff, add stuff, change it um, or, or, or analyze it. So I'm gonna keep quiet for exactly five minutes. Um, and then we'll take a look and see what you guys uh, have done. And I believe everyone has access to this slide deck. Uh, if you're able to do is, thank you Yasir for remembering to uh, re-record it again. Um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to share my screen again and I'm going to give you a little bit more deeper insights into how you can take this visual literacy a little bit further. And then we'll do this exercise again, because I want to make sure that we maximize the last 15 minutes that we have. Here's a paragraph. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 words in this sentence. The target of our workshop today is to bring awareness on the scope of impact and to ensure action is taken into taken to solve the problem. It's a sentence. Now, how do you begin to take a normal language literacy conventional sentence and start 
inputting visual literacy. So I'm going to demonstrate the process of how to design something. Okay, so this is a normal sentence and step by step, I'll show you what the process would be. So the next slide, slide 36, I actually decided to bold two portions of it because I felt in this sentence, what are the two important things? What is the biggest important message in this whole sentence is target, solve the problem. So in that whole 25 words, the only thing important in that entire sentence is we have a target and our target is we have to solve the problem. That's it. Everything, the blah, 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 blah in between is just that. It's blah, blah, blah in between. Okay. Then, but yeah, if I only say target solve the problem, I'm losing a lot of the details. So then I start highlighting more things. Then I start highlighting, I start making bold other words. I put the word awareness as bold. And then I put the word scope of impact as bold. And I put the word action as bold on top of the target solve the problem. Can you start seeing how now suddenly this paragraph becomes again back to square one, it becomes overwhelming. So when you highlight the things that are supposedly important, you end up highlighting too much. And again, it becomes absolutely useless. So we're back to square one, no different than the original um, uh, paragraph where mm, nothing really strikes you. So let's change the color. So I'm using red now instead of just bolding. And so I chose to make scope of impact in red and solve the problem in red. And the other parts that are bolded are just bolded in normal black. So now things stop popping up. When you look at this paragraph, you can see, ah, oh, our target is to solve the problem, but how do we do that? We really have to pay attention to the scope of impact. So it's starting to be a little bit more, um, uh, it speaks, there's a voice to this visual now. But what happens if I chose a different set of words? Now, slide 39, I didn't highlight in red scope of impact. Instead, I changed a shorter word. I, I, I used a single word. So scope of impact are three words. I left that as black in the background, but then I made awareness and action in red. So then it becomes much faster and easier to see because it's only a single word, awareness and a single word action instead of a phrase, scope of impact and solve the problem. So that's a different way of focusing it. But on slide 40, look what I've done. I've changed it and added more graphic methods. So by using bullet points, I can have words line up on each other. So the word awareness is sitting on top of the word action. The word scope of impact is sitting on top of the word solve the problem. So you start to get things that are shaped on the page as graphic objects in space being arranged in space creating a hierarchy. So that's already using a different level of visual literacy. But let's go even one step further. Slide number 41. The word target now is a single word in the middle of the page, center alignment. It's not reading left to right. Now we're reading top to bottom. So target is on top of the page and there's numbers introduced. So we can see in big bold, target is actually, let's see, how big is this font? I'm actually using a much bigger size font, size 48 as opposed to size 24. So it's double the font size. If you have fonts that are only maybe six points in different size, our eyes don't see the difference. But when you make the font size literally double from 24 points to 48 points. That's huge. That's a huge difference. So our eyeballs will immediately zoom in and target on the word target and the number one and number two. So when we look at this one, we know that there's two things important here. The details are not important. We just need to know we've got two targets. But on slide 42, we've carried the design one step further. Now the word isn't just target. Our target, both of these words, and this size is even bigger. This font is 120 points compared to 36 points. So that's 
literally four times the size. So at a ratio of four times the size, our eyes really zoom in on the word, our target. And we don't have any bullets. We don't have anything. There's a plus sign and one cluster of words on the left and another cluster of words on the right. So you know that there's two things with a plus sign in between. You don't even need to have the numbers one and two like you had on slide number 41. We had to label things, number one, number two. And that takes up too much attention. In slide 42, things have gotten simplified. There's only our target and there's two things. And if you have time, you read it. If you don't have time, you don't have to read it. Now, slide 43, we are now going into language literacy. I changed the word target to saying, instead of our target, I changed the word with a synonym. I said, our goal. So now we're heading into a different type of literacy here where we don't talk about just the target. We say, okay, if it's our collectively, we're using the brain now, we're changing the word target to goal. So it gives a different impact. And then slide number 44, taking that one step further, because we're saying goal, that means something that we value as opposed to just a target. Target just means we're gonna get there. Whereas a goal, you add a layer of value to it. And so I've changed the O from a circle using iconography and change it into a heart. So then you know that there's a value system here, important here. And then instead of saying our goal, I put the word your goal. Uh, and the word your is, now part of that heart. Uh, so you can play with graphics to add layers of meaning and then the color of the font changes. These are sort of lavender and pink. Um, so that gives another layer of meaning. Now, if you didn't want it to become sort of this value system with a heart shape and you really wanted it target, slide number 45 shows a different style. There's a literal target, like a, a shooting range target, a circle with a cross, like as if you're in a shooting range and you're targeting something. And it says, it doesn't say our target. It doesn't say your target. It says today's target. And you're just shooting at something. Why did I change the word our and your to today? Because then it's impersonal. Even if you don't like it, it's okay. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's today's target. And we're all going to be very neutral about it. And here it is. No, no running around the bush. It's today's target. And we just immediately see uh, this, this crossbow uh, target practice. And then you've got the two details sort of on the side uh, as a graphic. And we don't even need to read that if we, until we have time. But now fast forward, the last one. So this process actually went through about another four or five iterations of refinement. This was the end result. Slide 46 was the end result. And it has totally, the word target is gone. And the original sentence is gone. Instead, the sentence is replaced by, to focus on the near, sometimes you have to let go of everything else. So it isn't about, telling people what you're going to do. Instead, it is appealing to people what needs to be done. So it's actually the action itself is saying you have to let go of everything else. If you're going to target this, if you're going to focus on this, you have to let go of everything else. And there is a graphic added to it. There's actually a photograph of a spider that is on a window pane. And the spider is in absolute crystal clear focus. But in the background, you see there's a lake in the background beyond the window, beyond the spider, but the lake is blur because the entire camera is focusing on the spider and you're focusing sharply on the spider and you absolutely lost details in the background. Not important. Even the words start to hide and become hidden in the photograph. Uh, because the O, the focus of the O is on the spider, and it says to focus on the near, on that spider, you have to let go of everything else. So with that, I'm going to keep quiet, and now I invite all of you uh, to just unmute and give a response to this um, design process uh, in the few minutes that we have left. What do you think about that? This is taking visual literacy and really converting that conventional sentence or paragraph 
into something that has now become like almost a piece of art. It's a it's a it's a picture, uh, a meme. So uh, if anybody would like to uh, share in the last few minutes um, at all. Well, one of the things um, for me also has to do with who your audience is and what you want to project. So um, the, the one with the hearts with goal would not be, I, I teach business students, humanities students, gen ed courses. Um, so I'd have a wide range of, of people and depending on which group that I was working with, I would never do the goal with the heart for my mm -hmm. business students. That's Absolutely. What or science. Yep. Um, yep. So this gives, but I would the next one, which has the numbers, where a lot of them like numbers, that's what they're looking for. So it's exactly. sort of the rhetoric that goes part in partly the, towards that, which one you would use. Correct. Um, and that's that's the whole point of this visual literacy is that if you only rely on language literacy, you are not going to be able to get to that level of depth of appeal where you specifically target your audience. So this is that added layer of design that you can add to your materials so that it's not just the content that's visual, uh, that, that's, you know, that's the language part, but you actually add a layer uh, to know your audience personalities. Mm -hmm. yeah, but the other thing that um, keeps coming up for me has to do with the cultural piece and for languages um, where your audience maybe uh, doesn't read from right to left, um, or I'm sorry, left to right, <laughs> um, I think sometimes stacking it is easier for them because the top down um, mm -hmm. is easier for them to follow. Um, it's or universal, yeah. The picture, the way that you have it in the last one might be easier for them, although I find the, um, it's sort of hard to see the the actual um, written part in that. Yeah. So so in the end, to give you some background, the reason why in the end it ended up being a photograph of a spider with the words just kind of blurring in the background because this wasn't even given to an English speaking audience, hmm. and it didn't matter what the words were on there. They understood what the picture was trying to show. It's like, yeah, if you're going to try and take a picture of this, this spider, you have to let go of everything else. You just need to focus on the target and nothing else is important. So the words literally no longer have an importance. The words are there more just, you know, as a record or a documentation of what the original subject content was. But the message and the impact is what's important. So yeah, you're absolutely right. The cultural or linguistic um, uh, preference or, 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 or ability is something that really determines what method of delivery should you be designing for. Great point there. Anyone else? Um, I'm I'm happy to stay on the longer. Yes, sir. I know the official session is supposed to be just one hour, but I'm I'm happy to stay on a little longer. If anybody wants to, to 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 continue discussion, that would be really. Uh, happy All right. To... So I I'll stop the recording and uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, just have a meeting, but I can be a little late for five minutes or something. Okay. And Danielle said, I think less is more. Uh, it's best to keep out any.